Thank you, Chair. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all who are in the room and those who are watching remotely. Chair, I wish to apologize from the outset that once I've spoken and once my colleague from the workers has spoken, I'm going to take leave of the room because I need to be in the finance committee in about 15 minutes as it is. I'm going to be late for, for that. So I apologize most profusely. I've structured uh, the response or rather the intervention on two parts. So part one relates to the Global Commission on the Future of Work. As we celebrate the ILO's centenary, the employers group welcomes the first conference discussion on the future of work. We wanted the conference to give this topic far more airtime, but I suspect this will be the first of many discussions on the future of work in the years ahead. Over this fortnight, we are also having our first tripartite, a tripartite discussion on the report of the ILO Global Commission on the Future of Work. This 78-page document, which was published in January, provides an interesting contribution to this broad and fast-moving topic. We thank the participants and the authors for their contribution. Some of us participated in the Global Commission in a personal capacity, and we did so appreciatively as individuals, but not as representatives of our respective ILO constituents. As such, it is important to recognize that the Global Commission's report is not the position of this House. It is one of many outside contributions to stimulate discussion and thinking on the topic. It is not the final word. As one of my colleagues in my employer's group aptly said, it opines, it does not prescribe. Nor can it be the final word. We need to remember that the future world of work is not a static concept that one report alone will satisfactorily address. The future of our working world is unknown and it is always evolving. What's more, the combination of factors that determine and shape our work lives are also going to change and we cannot know for sure what measures will be best, let alone whether the tools in our current toolkit are even appropriate. Therefore, we need to continually discuss this topic, understand the phenomenon, and check our biases and preconceptions. Our response cannot be tied to one single report, especially that one that is not necessarily agreed upon by the tripartite constituents. Colleagues, I would like to address the substance of the report of the Global Commission on the Future of Work. On the one hand, the report includes some important elements. First, the report's overall goal to invest in people's capabilities, institutions of work, and decent and sustainable work is noble and we support this ambition. Second, the report captures the agency of the challenge before us and it recognizes the opportunities that advanced technologies offer. Third, we are pleased that the report fully embraces the understanding that there are diversities in the forms of work and that the report does not adopt the less clear and more political ILO terminology of standard versus non-standard forms of work. Fourth, the report recognizes the role of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises as important partners in the design of local approaches to adapt to climate change. National adaptation plans are traditionally based on state-driven policies. Therefore, this recommendation to engage micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises is seen as an innovative approach. 
On the other hand, it would be remiss of me not to explain the employer's concerns with the report so that our discussions this fortnight and in the future help the ILO to adopt an approach to the future of work in line with the position of its tripartite constituents. First, while we support the overall goal of the Global Commission's report, the challenge is its with, narrow, is its with its narrow definition and on how to achieve its vision in practice. Put simply, we will not achieve this ambitious aim without a conducive business environment. <coughs> Allow me to be a bit blunt. It's an occupational hazard. But the ILO needs to do a better job of promoting an enabling environment for job creation as an engine for decent work for all. The ILO's reluctance or timidity in this respect is holding back progress and undercutting many gains made. Linked to this, employers are frustrated that the Global Commission report fails to acknowledge the value that the private sector brings to the world of work. This despite our numerous requests and language proposals and despite assurances that this perspective would be included. The report does not include any recommendations aimed at improving the business environment, such as through promoting dynamism and investment and emphasizing productivity and the need for full and productive employment creation. In fact, it appears to mirror the general tide of policy making, which is towards top-down punitive or passive compliance measures that stifle investment and thwart dynamism. Hardly the right approach to achieve the ambitious sustainable development goals. Speaking at the Asian conference in Singapore in April as part of the Global Commission stroke centenary celebrations, the DG Guy Ryder said, open inverted commas, if we look at the Asian region in this context, we see that there is certainly a lot to celebrate here. Good reason to look to the future with both optimism and confidence in a region that continues to outperform all others in terms of economic growth. As we heard, the average growth rate of 5% between 2007 and 2017 was well above the average growth rate and some of the fastest growing economies in the world are represented in this room today with almost all Asian countries still above 5% annual growth, close inverted commas. This, ladies and gentlemen, is thanks to a huge emphasis on promoting and enabling a thriving private sector in that region. This region is, to me, like Wakanda, to use my favorite example in the Black Panther movie. It is thriving through its use of technology, innovation, and productivity, which leads to happier and more sustainable communities. Finally, Despite their good intentions, many recommendations and ambig are ambiguous, unrealistic, and unattainable. For example, the recommendation to establish a universal labor guarantee and on the expansion of time sovereignty are extremely problematic for my group as we consider them too vague, unfeasible, and too costly for business to finance. You may wonder what motivated the ex officio commissioners not to sign the report as appears on page 75. This is it. There is no way we could support a universal labor guarantee that we do not understand. I have listened with great intrigue as there is an attempt to sell this concept. Probably the attempt is to have something unique come out of the centenary celebration. However, I do not believe as a pragmatist and as someone who has built businesses and sold them and always paid attention to keeping my word rather than coming up with fashionable populist concepts in selling a product that is utopian and makes no sense. 
it is not fair to raise people's expectations in this way. Likewise, the recommendation on setting an international governance system for digital labor platforms that sets and requires platforms and their clients to respect certain minimum rights and protection is very challenging. We do not think that such a system of transnational rights can be established or successfully managed. On the contrary, it could be exploited or undermine certain freedoms. Alternatively, this requires more in-depth research and empirical evidence on how it should be approached. We need to be cognizant that some countries are still struggling with even having the word digital in their discourse. Until this has been addressed, all we would be doing is acting contrary to our repeated utterances of not leaving people behind and being inclusive. It would be empty rhetoric. We would be opening the gap further between the developed and the developing world and entrench entrenching the dominance of some while leaving others behind. Lastly, the recommendation on reshaping business incentive structures to implement the human-centered agenda lacks any accompanying proposal for establishing incentives for businesses to thrive in the future and invest in technology. Colleagues, as the world of work evolves, so too does our need to evolve with it. Employers' organizations recognize this challenge and we are carefully considering our future, our future role as we confront the reality of technological innovation, demographic changes, the impact of climate change, the need for greater sustainability, and the widespread skills shortage to meet these challenges. Earlier this year, the IOE and ACTEMP published a report of our own to guide employer and business membership organizations to identify opportunities emerging from these changes and prioritize action to shape such transformations by adjusting and innovating. We make the case that business needs to maintain confidence in the possibilities available by associating under the umbrella of employer and business membership organizations that offer the right mix of representation and services. The future of work is a daunting prospect for everyone. Through efforts such as our report, we are stimulating strategic discussions among our members about their future role and how they can be best adapted and best innovate to serve their members and society at large as well. Ladies and gentlemen, what lies at the root of how we prepare for and manage the future of work, which also lies at the root of tackling so many social and labor related challenges from child labor to informality is the critical importance of education and skills. Allow me to quote my dear former president, Nelson Mandela, whose video of his ILO visit was played in this august house when my president, the current one, Cyril Ramaphosa, was here a day or two ago and whose centenary of his birth started last year and ends in July, a month from now. Open inverted commas, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Close inverted commas, sailed Nelson Mandela. This truism applies to governments as policymakers, budget allocators, and curriculum setters, to employers as hiring managers and skills developers, and people themselves as workers and members of families and their communities. This truism is also the reason 
that in spite of the intentions of apartheid in my country to destroy some of us, and in spite of some having lived our lives under apartheid for half of our lives in far-flung rural villages with no infrastructure, apartheid failed, partly because we still had education. May not have been great, but it was certainly something to go on. It is the reason I am here today to address you. It is powerful beyond measure. Educations and skills free you, and it is our individual and collective responsibility to make it possible for all. This is how we contribute to taking a lot of people with us and leaving no one behind. When it comes to deciding how we collectively apply our energy and resources, education and skills development should be at the top of the list. Roberto Suarez, our Secretary General, already covered this aspect in his intervention earlier, but it is worth repeating. Skills are the currency of the modern workplace, and focusing on skills development is the best way to empower workers to reach their potential and provide for their families. Yes, we are striving for decent work, but decent work is illusionary without jobs, and workers cannot get jobs, let alone good jobs, without skills. There is no way around this. A just transition without education and skills is again empty rhetoric. Our report found that it is already becoming harder to recruit people with the skills needed. What's more, Education systems are partially responsible for the dearth of capable and skilled workers. At the same time, our report found that businesses themselves are interested in playing an active role in skills development and that while improving skills requires investment and new approaches, the long-term necessity is apparent to business leaders. Skills development and better education are a global imperative. My group calls on the ILO and its member states to dramatically increase their focus on supporting lifelong learning and development programs. These are essential to building and maintaining a functional talent pool so that the labor force matches the labor market and so we can ensure decent work in evolving labor markets. I recently read a tremendous book called Factfulness by a Swedish professor, Hans Rosling. In it, he provides 10 reasons why we're wrong about the state of the world and why things are better than we think. Professor Rosling also explains that we need to educate our citizens better, especially children. For example, he says, we should be teaching our children that there are countries on all different levels of health and income and that most are in the middle. He also says we should be teaching them about their own country's socioeconomic position in relation to the rest of the world and how that is changing all the time. We should be teaching how to hold the two ideas at the same time, that bad things are going on in the world, but that many things are getting better. We should be teaching them that the world will keep changing, and they will have to update their knowledge and worldview throughout their lives. These points, especially the last one, are the recipe for an honest approach to our challenges and an honest approach to young people and other workers that allows them to adapt and grow. If we want to help workers cope with stresses of our changing world, providing quality education and opportunities for skills development are essential. In relation to the report of the chair of the governing body, Colleagues, allow me to turn my attention to the report of the chair of the governing body for the year 2018-2019. As the employer's spokesperson in the governing body, I can attest 
to the robust debates we have had in the last 12 months on a wide range of topics that are covered in the Chair's report. We thank the Chair for preparing this summary, and we would like to provide some observations on it. First, while there is still some way to go before the goal of universal ratification of the ILO core conventions is attained, with 123 ratifications covering 43 member states still needed. It is encouraging that many reporting countries have provided richer information on their efforts in this regard. More quality information allows the office to bolster progress and support constituents on the ground to overcome challenges, such as through concrete requests for technical assistance. As I already said, ratification is important, but more important is effective implementation. One without the other will deliver no positive impacts on the ground. Second, regarding the enterprise initiative, the strategy for wider ILO engagement with the private sector is a priority for the employers group. Engaging with enterprises of all sizes and in all regions allows the office to better understand the challenges and realities that companies face and can help the office to develop a more practical approach to problem solving. It also facilitates a two-way exchange of information. Third, employers call on the ILO to step up its efforts to promote and protect the role of social partners in all aspects of the UN reform process and its outcomes. There has not been sufficient consultation with employers and the private sector on a number of issues, and we worry that efforts to amalgamate the UN's work under various UN resident coordinators will further diminish our collective voice. One concrete and shared goal of the IOE and ITUC, which you heard both from Sharon Barrows and Roberto Suarez earlier on, is for both our organizations to be granted observer status in the UN General Assembly. We appeal to states in the ILO centenary year to help make this a reality. Finally, the office needs to make a far greater effort to represent all three tripartite constituents equally in its work and in its composition. I already raised this point in my opening remarks earlier this week, and I kindly refer you back to what I said in that speech. Insofar as the situation facing workers of the Arab-occupied territories is concerned, ladies and gentlemen, for almost 40 years, the Director General has produced an annual report on the situation facing workers of the occupied Arab territories. This year's report follows an ILO or mission, mission, rather, mission to the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, Gaza, Israel, and the occupied Syrian Golan, as well as a meeting in Cairo and Damascus. Information on the labor market in the Arab-occupied territories presents a bleak picture. Unemployment has increased, especially in Gaza, and general labor participation is declining. It is the long-standing policy of the employers group to never comment on complex and deep-rooted political conflicts, which are the result of long-standing disagreements and tensions between states. However, my group would like to make some points about the labor market in those territories. First, it seems clear that with shrinking public resources, the jobs will have to be generated by the private sector, both in Gaza and the West Bank. However, it is very hard for the private sector to invest in these places. Therefore, we encourage both the Israeli and Palestinian authorities to carry out effective dialogue with business to build an environment conducive to job creation. Second, we encourage the international community to increase financial support to help 
the most vulnerable in those territories and lift restrictions on economic activity to allow business to operate and contribute to job growth. Third, moving forward on the electronic payment of wages would help curb the problems associated with the activities of brokers. Fourth, as the employer said last year, the ILO should provide large-scale technical assistance to build the cap capacities of all constituents on the ground within the framework of the flagship program on fragile states and disaster response. Fifth, the ILO should continue supporting labor, labor reform processes through tripartite partnerships and consultations. And lastly, we encourage the ILO to provide technical support and advice on the skills development of Palestinian workers. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, this segment of the conference addresses many challenges in the world today. Yes, we are here to celebrate the success of the ILO through the work of its constituents. This is entirely and deservedly appropriate. Celebrate, we must. However, just because we made it to 100 does not mean we will endure for another 100 years. None of us can rest on our laurels, and the employers group takes this challenge very, very seriously. I refer all of you to my speech again that I delivered on Monday, so you can have a context to what we are talking about. It is our firm belief that we need to be honest about the challenges and uncertainties that lie ahead. And we also must encourage workers and employers, especially the younger generations, to take on the challenge ahead in a way that empowers them and allows them to adapt and grow. As a proud South African, I'd like to quote Mr. Mandela again, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the future we must create, and I thank you.